First of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Fujitsu for giving me an opportunity to share some of our thoughts with you. Uh, the thoughts that I'm going to share with you, of course, is in terms of the great technologies that's available from great companies like Fujitsu, but also take it down to how do we implement this kind of solutions and technologies in a country like ours, especially when we're up uh, into implementing some of the largest things in the world. The first thing is that in all our needs that we have as human beings, uh, a new need has come about. We have our social needs, we have our emotional needs, and now we have our digital needs. And this digital need is slowly and slowly becoming larger and larger in each and every aspect of our lives. So we have two parallel lives, if you can truly ask me uh, from the sense of the term. One is a real life and one is a digital life. In this digital life and in the real life, the differentiators are very little. All of you, each one of you in this room who have your children are very well aware that the time spent on the digital world by them as well as us is slowly growing and growing and growing. So now how do we take across all the technologies that's available in this world to kind of cater to the requirements of a new human need, which is a digital-centric need? The world stands at the cusp of a digital revolution, and India stands at the cusp of a digital explosion. If we are to combine these two together, then the addressability has to go down right up to an Indian village, as you see. The concept of uh, digital India. But before, before I take you across some of the technologies and some of the key areas which can help you uh, achieve that, I think it's key to understand a few of the challenges that we are faced up with, in, in, in particularly in a country like India, with such a large population base. We have to reach out to 260,000 villages in the first phase, we're all aware. Most of us in this room would be aware. We have to take it to 600,000 villages in phase two. Now, 260,000 villages you can only reach through a an, an network. Now, the question of the network is, we can lay fiber, we can have newer and newer fiber laids in unconquered territories, but can we intelligently expand the cap cap capacity and the capability of existing networks? Are we thinking in those lines? Do we have the technology by virtue of which a fiber that's laid for 10 Mbps can be enhanced to 100 Mbps or one gig without replacing that physical fiber? Are we thinking in those lines? The only physical device that's possibly reached every Indian village is, is a mobile handset, almost close to 900 million users. If you are to deliver any kind of services across to this huge cross-section of people, we will have to reach out to this many mobile handsets. Do we have the networks to reach those handsets? Can we take our applications onto those, on those, onto those devices and deliver from multiple agencies? Can we kind of uh, take it to an area where, uh, where, let's say, any integrated data or video service can be enabled right across to a village level? We'll have to think of that. The processing power or the capability of a mobile handset is limited. So can we use intelligence and intelligently keep the features, some of the features which we need at a particular point of time outside, maybe in a cloud, and bring it back when we need it and as we need it as we start rolling out and delivering of these services. The first thing, the first challenge of any government is to roll out governments and uh, governance services. One of the proposals and one of the proposed ways of going forward in this direction is to have a live enterprise collaboration uh, kind of platform, technology platform, which can integrate live video, live data in all its formats, in multiple formats, right up to any physical handset that may exist 
can we be able to do this? If you're able to do this, then the delivery of the services that the government is planning becomes that much more easier because that's the only way to deliver if you're trying to do this. So here in the screen, you see multiple videos uh, of, of the offices where people earlier used to visit, earlier used to go, earlier used to interact. Can it be delivered right on their pumps? Can we deliver data integrated with this? Can it be in any language? Can it be in any format? Imagine 33% of the population possibly is very close to below the literacy level. Now, just sending a pure form or an app right up to an Indian village may not enable someone to comprehend what is written in that particular form. One of the best ways to communicate in such circumstances could be a combination of video and data integrated together because you need to talk to a person who cannot read a particular form. Just sending the form will only have another middle agency in between who's going to comprehend or kind of change that form for him. That's not going to help. So can we have in any language a data and a video combination delivered on a mobile handset when we are struggling for call drops every now and then? All of us here would have witnessed in some form or the other. How do we achieve that? How do we do that through technology? One of the key areas, if, uh, if we are to undertake as a part of this nation, uh, nation's uh, greatest endeavors in technology, is that you're going to take 30 years to make a teacher, and a baby will be born every minute. There is no other physical way but to extend the reach of the teacher right up to every nook and corner of this country. And if you have to do that, there is only one device, so the challenges are increasing. You may have desktops in the cities, you may have desktops, laptops, tablets, everything around, but in a village level, the only device that's reached probably is a mobile handset. Okay. Oops. Sorry. So can we deliver a live classroom from a teacher who's sitting somewhere central in a place like Delhi, and can it go to the remotest corner in a village in Kerala? Can we do that? So that is the challenge. Of course, this, if you're able to bridge, then bridging in any kind of modules in terms of the in terms of e-learning or learning paradigms or content that is available can be easily integratable. Because if you can integrate video on the mobile handset, you can integrate any piece of data. That's not a problem. Can we get into a scenario like this, where everything is happening remotely? Everything is happening where data is being shared, where peer groups are being formed, where peer teachers are coming in to help their students, or peers, or learning mechanisms, or corporates, or trainings. Whatever is being undertaken is happening through a mechanism which is similar to this. Can we achieve this in this, in this country, in this particular area? Probably it's seeming that, 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 uh, uh, that uh, looks difficult. But ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, I think we are exploring, we are probably exploring uh, the protocols and the other kind of communication mediums and channels which have been explored before, and we are only trying to further their cause in going forward. Let me give you a parallel example in the government of Australia. The Australian government wanted to give one gigabyte to its citizens. And in an uh, ability to do so, it had, it had kind of wanted to take as a pilot 10% of Australia's population live on video. Nobody had seen that level of scale of video integration on a worldwide basis. If, I, if, you, if you look at intelligently, you have people from telecommunications here would uh, uh, appreciate there are only three known levels of protocols available for communication. One is broadcast that we do for television channels, which we all get it in our homes. The second part is what we do as unicast, where multiple data packets or video packets will have to be sent to multiple you know, dropping zones where you need to communicate or talk. The third level is multicast. Multicast has been extensively used worldwide by defense services, particularly in VSAT kind of networks. People who have seen VSAT networks would understand that. And particularly, if, if multicast for the forward packet, whether it is one or one million or one billion, it's going to reach in one bandwidth. 
It's not going to take multiple, multiple packets to be sent across and trying to work on compression algorithms after compression algorithms and trying to make it support more and more, that solution. And exactly in a similar fashion, the Australian government's two research body, NICTA and CSIRO, chose multicast as the delivery network transmission protocol. If you can do that, then whichever physical device that you have at the end zone or the end, end point that you want to power, you can reach in the same bandwidth. There is no replication of that. Comes the same problem. 25 years to make a doctor, again a baby is born every minute. So the doctor's reach is to be extended. Two very similar problems, and any government around the world, the KRA is education and healthcare. If you have to do that, the important part is, in, 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 in things like telemedicine, it's not only important to see a video of a patient, but can at any point in time, can you see the prescription? Can you see the x-ray plates? Can you take the live feed from a machine and deliver that on a mobile handset? If you're able to do that, then only can you be able to extend the reach of that doctor right up to the end point in every Indian village, okay? Or in any village in the world and on a worldwide basis. Once again, these are key issues which are not only achievable, but has been achieved and has to be looked into with much, much more care vis-a-vis -vis the traditional ways of looking at communicating various kind of data points and various kind of video points across, across devices. Uh, can we just go, go into, uh, probably this, this screen, ladies and gentlemen, looks very futuristic to you. Six, seven, eight videos, people talking on one mobile handset. It is not only, it is not only, uh, let me uh, come a one step forward and tell you, it is not only, uh, uh, you know, uh, achievable, but any point in time, a similar kind of thing that you would like to see, please get in touch and we will be able to show you. It is doable right in this country, very easily, very effectively, without getting into the traditional route of, pump, of the bandwidth pumps that we are doing, uh, we are getting into. Again, any levels of data integrated with that. The government, after delivering governance, it is citizens' empowerment. Once again, essentially, it is interacting with government officials from the remotest corners of the country. And of course, this collaboration, this communication, it is a total combination of delivery of data, of video, across a cloud service, across multiple kind of hosting services, across multiple devices, across multiple server farms, across multiple infrastructures. It is seamless. It does not matter. <laughs> Entertainment, of course, has already been achieved. So one extension of having channels into this kind of device is not really, uh, not really that great a challenge anymore. But coming in with multiple kind of zones or multiple kind of channel plays in a single handset or a single delivery point, uh, which would include, of course, desktops, tablets, mobiles, any piece of delivery equipment that you may have. This has been achieved to a great extent in the country by our state uh, SWAN level networks that has happened. But once again, taking it to a level where many, many more, because now we are talking about addressability of 260,000 villages and across almost 900 million handsets. What we were doing across districts and talukas has to extend to an enormous, huge capability and size. Social media is at the human-centric human, human -centric kind of uh, existence today for all of us. Can we integrate social media, get the information that is required for us to cater to those requirements, human-centric requirements that we have? Can we integrate with the needs can we integrate with what kind of peer group developments that is happening through social media, capture that, provide it to do enterprises in a, in a manner and fashion, as well as the government, which helps them to make analysis that much more faster. And in any case, this is, this is one of the greatest things in which we have to, uh, you know, we have to uh, probably provide all our thought process and all our technologies behind the same. When you are Close to a, a human proximity, each one of us are trying to consistently and continuously make assessment of another 
human being or rather group of human beings in order to serve better, in order to provide decision makings better. But when that happens across devices or across distances, it becomes difficult. So worldwide, many of the technologies in security and analytics are going, getting into technologies such as facial recognition and other kind of things that helps you to do better decision making, faster decision making, quicker decision making in order to deliver uh, your end objectives. Of course, I will not touch the area of smart city today because there are many uh, fellow speakers who will cover that in detail. But one of the key things in smart cities is security and security and surveillance. If I look at security and surveillance today, is it just the capture of cameras and delivery of that across hours of videotapes that you need to see? Can you have exceptions? Can you mark if anyone who is going above a speed of four kilometers be reported on a mobile handset, okay? Can you mark something like you're trying to, trying to break into your house, I mean open your house, and that, doesn't, that shouldn't get reported and the cops shouldn't come and catch you because that's your house at the end of the day. Whereas if someone else tries to do that, the reporting should happen to them. So intelligence is coming into just mere camera surveillance in a much, much more sophisticated way worldwide. Can we implement such things? Can we implement all the people, all one million people who are coming down from train stations with a black bag for our security and analysis kind of people who need such data many a times on an urgent or very urgent basis? Or can we have moving objects go by, maybe in a car, and then pick up data and anything that seems suspicious is reported back to the car and again to the central decision making servers where people are looking at it 24 by 7. So I think if you bring in intelligence at that level, those are some of the things that will make our smart cities really much, much more smarter. Of course, human tra tracking of live video is possible and ex you know, exception-based handling is possible today in all its possible formats. Banking and financial, uh, BFSI as an industry from a million to a billion accounts, you need two things. You need the strength of the network to be, catered to, uh, to be able to cater to the billion accounts, as well as you need the capacity and the capability to interact and provide with those remote services where you're not going to have branches. Imagine if you don't have a branch, then how do you take the branch to the person? How do you enable that branch? And most of this is very, very relevant in the case of India because you're not going to have a branch into every village. Even the, even the largest bank in the country cannot achieve that. But if you're going to have a billion accounts from a million, you'll, you have to start uh, thinking about it and you'll have to start catering to the needs of it as to how do we take the bank to that level. Of course, every bank will have, make you fill up some form, which you in any case have to do. So they can be, they can be handled or helped through a common service center, or of course the post offices that, that are being empowered to kind of achieve those objectives in the Digital India rollout plan. Content is king was, uh, was the buzzword a couple of years ago. It is emerging as a super king now. Because if you are trying to deliver to a population group which probably has literacy levels at a very, very low or minimalistic level, then you're going to lead a lot of animation, a lot of, uh, lot of graphics, a lot of things to be able to explain what he intends to do in, in farming, in agriculture, in, in many, many such areas where he needs constant help. So you've got to make that content not only develop it like that, but again, once again, deliver in, that, in those devices. Of course, I will have many qualified speakers who will speak on the solutions that Fujitsu has been giving the world and traffic management solutions and urban traffic management, especially in cities like Delhi, Mumbai, we all understand that very, very well. And I think some of the solutions that they've been implementing worldwide, I'm sure many of the experts are going to give you much, much more details, is going to be very, very effective for at least our main cities, A and B class cities as we go forward. Some of the solutions, of course, more details will be shared by the experts, so I'm not going to get there because there's going to be breakout sessions and we're going to hear more about them. But yes, uh, I, I have gone through some of them and hosted in the cloud and the information going back and then relaying it to the vehicle is, is something which is very unique. And in a country like India, it is such 
much, much more such, of such great relevance. I understand that they have been implemented in Germany, Taiwan, Singapore, and North America, and uh, cities behave worldwide in a slightly similar fashion. Food and agriculture, I understand great work has been done by Fujitsu in this, in this area. And of course, the Fujitsu cloud, and many of you would be aware of that, helps in real-time monitoring of, of the environment and greenhouse effects that you have. And I'm sure you'll hear much more about as the day goes. And then agriculture extends to the animals, which is so critical for, for our existence as a human being. So therefore, the management solutions that gets to a better breeding, better solutions for them, is definitely going to help, help us as human beings all the way. And I understand that there is a very interesting project that's going on where we are trying to control parameters into your R&D labs and trying to make grow a particular type of rice, I was told, is, is very unique. And I'm sure many of you here would, from Fujitsu will definitely uh, be able in a better position to explain that uh, further. And the implementations have been happening in such countries as Turkey, Vietnam, South Korea, and China. And of course, the big data is what I think Andy spoke a lot about, so I'm not going to touch too much on that. And the customer experiences that he spoke about are indeed heartening uh, to listen. Now, for those of you who want to understand the government's policies on, on, on the digital India as, as, as we go forward, they're essentially, of what we spoke about, is things that can be implemented under the same framework. We need broadband as connectivity. We need broadband for all, reaching to every village. 260,000 villages is the first target. So there's rural networks, and there's urban and national networks, looked after by multiple agencies of the government, which is propagating that in its, all its facets. You need this for everything that we spoke about, education, healthcare, governance, banking, commerce, these highways are essential. But what we spoke about before, and when I correlate this with this particular slide, is integrating that and building the capacity of the same network in which we are planning. If we lead, if we kind of lay a broadband highway, can we increase the capacity of that highway for all the services that we're going to deliver? It is doable, ladies and gentlemen. The focus of penetration, of course, is on mobile handsets. We are one of the largest mobile using countries in the world, as you know. And with 700 million going up to 900 million handsets, it is indeed, there is, there is possibly no other growth that can possibly, uh, you know, overrun this compared to what's been happening in the country. And uh, the data says that there are over 50,000 villages in this country which have problems in remote access, even in mobile handsets. And the idea is to take the network to them, even th those villages where networks are not strong enough, uh, using a mobile kind of network infrastructure. The two things that we have right now as a point of delivery and mechanism are the common service centers. Many of you know the common service centers were set up, but they did not become that much more effective because there was a program, the program of Digital India was recently announced, and now possibly the idea with which it was created can get its full shape. And I think that what 135,000 common service centers that have been set up in the country, and this will be taken up to almost 250,000 in the next one and a half to two years. The number of services that will be available from the government is going to be, uh, it's going to be humongous. And of course, these services need to start, but right Education to banking to healthcare to every possible facet is going to be addressed through these networks and, and, and through these services. The next is in the Indian post offices. The Indian post offices, almost close to 150,000, are going to be pressed into service so that the remote access points can become closer till the time the mobile handsets reach every, every, everyone in, on their palms. We're very close to that. But still, the time it happens, these are going to be nodal points, extension of offices right up to every village. Of course, government process, the government is in its process of re-engineering and putting up multiple infrastructure and the way it looks at things. And empowerment will happen the faster if we are able to do that at the government level. And various ministries and departments are tirelessly working towards that. 
The transformation of online is a digital dream and that is what we are kind of witnessing right at this point in time. Our focus is to kind of take it to a level where everything becomes accessible online by everyone in the country. And uh, with, with the pace in which the implementation is, uh, is uh, being pushed forward, we hope it will soon be a very, very close reality. And of course, of course, this will lead to a better governance because better governance is always a function of, of, of leading uh, you know, the governmental, uh, or, or in other words, least, uh, least governance being implemented. Language is in, we have so many languages and the language barriers are, has to be transcended. And therein comes a very, very interesting part of our, our thought process is the, uh, is the area that, well, uh, one of the key things along with content and multiple content areas is, of course, your ability to speak across devices. That's going to create the barrier bridge a lot more. E-Country is a host of services which I'm not going to get your details into too much, but just, it's just the number of services that's going to happen across the government, which is going to cover a multitude of things like education, healthcare, justice, security, and, and covers the entire paradigm of every possible facet of government service. And behind all this will be the core technology that's being laid. Of course, the newer edge into technology has to be given by all of us put together, all the great technologies that's happened on a worldwide basis. Cybersecurity is a concern for all of us, and cybersecurity is going to go to the next dimension as well. So we got to get prepared not only with the traditional means of cybersecurity, but uh, and I will leave behind a small thought process here. I will not go into too much of depth. But imagine if I have a smart home and I'm able to control uh, your smart devices, which was what smart homes were meant initially when we started off. You were driving down and you could just, with your, with your mobile handset, you could switch on your microwave and you can get your food hot. But that also means that I can physically take charge of your electrical circuits in a way. And if I can do that, then this, this cybersecurity will get to the next dimension, which today's topic, uh, we need not delve into greater details, but that's the next generation of things that will come and we'll have to get prepared for it. This is the government platform, of course, the My Government and, and all, the, all the social kind of things that we're trying to engage in. Online messaging and social media is at the peak of, of, of its, its, its kind of... Uh, uh, our helm of, helm of things that we want to take forward. And online messaging will happen. Uh, it's, in a country like India, the base and the pace at which it is happening will increase many folds when the accessibility is being addressed right to every village. Earlier we were into tier A, tier B, tier C cities. Now we are going into villages. So the messaging dimension will change dramatically. And of course, we have structures. So in terms of the hardware capabilities, ladies and gentlemen, we as a country export $100 billion of software, but only export $6 billion of hardware. Our internal requirements by 2020 are going to go to $400 billion. So the gap uh, by 2020 with a growth parameter of this kind, we are only going to reach $80 billion. So $320 billion of Make in India, uh, supported by the largest of companies worldwide, has to happen here if this dream is to become a reality. $320 billion is the figure that's being targeted by 2020. This, of course, gets into the kind of conditions that we have here in its slightly greater complexities. And of course, we all are aware of our young population, our middle class, and how they can be correlated with all the aspects of, of governance into the, and brought into the manufacturing paradigm. I will not dwell too much of details here. The national electronic policy is a policy that has been targeting to help this. And it's been, the ESDM, as you know, had been launched across the countries and multiple clusters are being set up as a first step to take manufacturing into that level. They are available for all kinds of development in the country, right? Our requirement is right from a fab to an ATM 
to any level of complexity in hardware manufacturing, in electronics, in avionics, everything put together. That's the figure that we mentioned. And of course, if you have to have a strong country, then you have to have a very skilled uh, economy and the capability to deliver skills at every level. And the national policy for skill development is possibly kind of bridging that, bridging that gap of how we can create massive amount of skills in the country in all sectors that is going to make a difference in our governance. The Northeast has been identified as one of the largest BPO regions because of its uh, affinity uh, to uh, the quality of education that it has and language and a huge amount of, huge amount of potential has been identified over there. And uh, one of the largest projects in a BPO industry is happening in the Northeast part of our country. And last but not the least, some of the services are also help to help find the missing person and all other amenities that come here. Before I kind of uh, give it to my next speaker and kind of carrying on this uh, uh, good effort in terms of the multiple sessions that you have, I'm going to touch behind a few things in technology that I think are very, very important. I think from a human-centric innovation perspective, we all are trying to replicate our own capability. And two of the things that I'd like to mention are uh, where tech Today, when we are looking at technology, when we are looking at any screen, physical screen, be it a mobile handset, be it a laptop, or be it a desktop, or a large screen, or a panel, we are essentially degrading human capability, which can see in perfect 3D in naked eyes, absolute naked eyes. But when we look at a particular screen, we, have, we are taking a view of 2D. So technology here, instead of being an enhancer, is, is kind of trying to take us one step below. And worldwide, all major companies are working in, in this space where three-dimensional viewing can happen just like we do at, this, uh, at, 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 uh, at each other and every, any object that we see around us. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, we have been working in such a research area of creating three-dimensional viewing in naked eyes. Uh, to, be, to, be, uh, to come uh, forward with you, we're currently patenting that technology, what it has been achieved absolute three dimension in naked eyes on any physical device worldwide. And I believe that that will be the next generation of vision that's going to happen in terms of how our ability, how we can see and see things close to one another. Of course, it uses a very complex uh, algorithm, but that's how we've been able to achieve the same. And of course, in, in terms of our uh, capabilities, uh, and I would leave this thought behind, Human beings are trying to replicate what they can do internally to their outside world. And in the field of education, you will be probably astonished to hear some of the research initiatives done on a worldwide basis. And this is not science fiction that I'm going to talk to you about. It is reality and real life what has happened. There is a professor at the University of Reading. In the mid-80s, the University of Maryland did a research where they took a Cray supercomputer with 256 parallel processors and try to compare that with the human brain. Uh, 256 parallel processors give, could give power equivalent to only one million neurons. And our human brain has got about one billion neurons in one cubic centimeter. So all the engineers in the early 80s who were studying uh, artificial intelligence actually actually died down because we were too sophisticated as an equipment to be matched by human capability to replicate outside our bodies. Uh, almost 20 years later, Kevin Warwick, and each one of you can Google him, he's from the University of Reading. Many of you who have seen the movie uh, uh, iRobo, the concept of that has been taken from, uh, from, from that particular, from him actually, he's called the Cyborg Man. He's created a processor which is implanted on his wrist He's connected his median nerve, and he's connected the internet. Today, ladies and gentlemen, by mere thinking, he can switch off a bulb which is 4,000 miles away. By mere thinking, he can drive a car. And uh, Kevin and Irina Warwick are the first married couple to experience CNS to CNS communication. And this is not science fiction. It has already happened. Each one of you can Google him and find out. So that is where 20 universities around the world have begun to believe 
that human centric innovation which was which is inside you is slowly come outside and who knows you can also connect to the network thank you so much